My name is Timothy Lattis. I'm currently working at Uni in the Graphics Innovation Group. Prior, I worked at AMD working on FSR1. Hello, my name is Clever Garcia. I am a rendering engineer who's currently working in the high definition rendering pipeline for the Unity engine. Fidelity FX Super Resolution Version 1 is AMD's new spatial scaling algorithm. So, the first part of this talk is the FSR1 algorithm. The goals for FSR1 was to provide a framework for scaling that fits in dynamic resolution scaling. So that means that scaling can change every frame if it needs to. The goal here is to reduce frame costs by reducing the render resolution. The other main thing about this was that it had to be easy to integrate, easily portable to just about anything, and something which adds no temporal artifacts to the video signal. So if you use an anti-aliasing that doesn't have temporal artifacts and you process through this algorithm, you can't be adding any temporal artifacts that didn't exist. Thus, for FSR1, the algorithm focused on spatial scaling and spatial sharpening. The scaler of FSR1 attempts to remove the resampling artifacts on the existing edges that would normally happen using traditional resampling during scaling. The goal here is to basically make the edge look as if it's native, but not to introduce new edges that didn't exist in the source image. The source code for FSR1 can be found on GPU Open. There are two components to the source code. There is a portability header, and then there's an algorithm header. The algorithm header has a collection of algorithms. There's approximately five. The first one is the scaling algorithm. It is called ECU, or Edge Adaptive Spatial Upsampling. And that's what I'm going to be covering now. ECU had a name. That aim was to provide better scaling than the previous solution of using CAS, which is Contrast Adaptive Sharpening, followed by the hardware scaling that's built into the graphics card. The hardware scaling that's built into the graphics card visually looks like horizontal and vertical Lancos. Lancos being a resampling algorithm that is a sync function, which is a theoretically optimal reconstruction filter, windowed by another sync function, which is truncated. The windowing enables the, the function to actually be computationally feasible. In order to do better than the hardware scaling, we had to do something more adaptive. So ECU focuses on something that's locally adaptive to the properties around the pixel. It's directionally and length and window adaptive. And thus, ECU is probably best described as a locally adaptive, elliptical, Lancos-like filter. Due to this adaptability, ECU requires input with good anti-aliasing as a base. So if you, it's not an anti-aliasing solution by itself, but it does definitely require AA going into it. ECU starts with a 12-tap fixed kernel window, so the nearest 12 taps in a circular pattern. The reason why 12 taps was chosen instead of 16 is that with 12 taps, you only need 36 registers for the 32-bit version. ECU requires an analysis on those 12 taps before it can figure out the filter kernel. So in order to avoid reading the 12 taps twice, it's got to keep all of them in registers during the full algorithm. And therefore, if we went to anything higher, we'd run out of temporary registers for logic. And the goal being that we want to keep around or under 64 registers, because that's a good upper limit on AMD's hardware to be able to hide latency. So for analysis, ECU first starts looking at the uh, plus patterns which surround the inner 2x2 two two quad. So if we look at the 12-tap the terminal, there's four taps in the center. In each one of those, it's got to compute the analysis of direction and length. And to do the analysis, it's working in LUMA. And by LUMA, I mean an approximation, just red, two green, plus blue. So it's not complicated LUMA, it's just get all the, all the channels together so we don't miss anything. 
for the analysis, it's doing the analysis on the 12, or sorry, on the two, two by two quad. And this is a form effectively of pass merging. Though that analysis could be done once in a previous pass, but then we would re require two full trips through memory, and therefore we don't want to do it. So we duplicate a little bit of work in the shader, thus we don't have to go through memory as many times. Once the analysis is finished, we're going to bilinearly interpolate the analysis at the position we actually want to filter at, and that's going to be used to shape the final filter kernel. For the sampling of this 12-tap pattern, Vega Navi, PS4 Pro, PS5, and other hardware that supports PAC 16-bit ops can find some advantages. Specifically, if you can do two 16-bit ops for the cost of one op, and you can also save register space. AMD's hardware also supports an A16 modifier to vector memory operations, which enables packed arguments so that you can have an X and a Y stored in one register for the load, the coordinates for the load, and also D16 packed returns so that you can get the results of that load or texture fetch packed for you so you do not have to pack them later. If we want to use structure of array form, we can use gather4. So gather4 will pull all the reds and we'll get two registers back, two 32-bit registers, with all the four values. And by doing this, we can do computation, we can do pack computation really well without having to swizzle things around. The other, other way we facilitate this is the 12-tap pattern is using something that is not a regular grid for sampling, it's more of a plus pattern, so that the X, Y, and ZW pairs have the necessary data for the 12 taps we're interested in. And that way, I don't, if I was to do a 4x4 four four pattern to get 16 values, I'd be throwing out corners. So this thing does a little bit uh, of a plus pattern instead. For the analysis, once the taps are in, the edge direction is estimated using a central difference. The central difference does miss single pixel features. However, as we'll see later, as feature length becomes very small, the filter kernel becomes symmetric and non-directional. So we don't care about directionality for thin features. And therefore, a, a diagonal diff is not used. And also a diagonal diff would have been more expensive and then we would have had to deal with the half texel offset, which would have made the logic a little bit more complicated. So once the edge direction is finished, we look at feature length. And by feature length, we're estimating that using the three texels in the horizontal and the three texels in the vertical, and looking what happens with the luma gradient. If the luma gradient has a reversal, for instance, starting at black, going to white, and returning to black, that would be a full reversal, which is a significant, um, it's a significant probability that that is a thin feature. Whereas if we look at something that has no reversal, say going from black to white and then white, that's probably a large feature which we can have a larger fil filter kernel on. ECU and color spaces. Most gaming AA ends up with perceptually even gradients on the edges. And therefore, we want the directional analysis to be done in the perceptual color space. Perceptual as in sRGB, gamma 2.0, gamma 2.2, or something similar. This way, the computation is not that expensive because if we were to do, if we were to input in linear and then have to convert to perceptual, we'd be doing it 12 times for the, for the 12 taps. So it's much better, in fact, required for good performance to factor any linear to perceptual translation in the prior pass prior to ECU. You can still run ECU in, in linear, it just won't look as good on some content. The one compromise, of course, is if we're running on perceptual, we're, we're running all the filtering on perceptual. But as it turns out, this is, this is typically acceptable in this case. So once we have all the analysis finished, we got a direction and length for all the, the two by two quad. And now we're going to use the direction to rotate the filter kernel. And we're going to use the length to change the post rotation kernel scaling in the X and Y axis. And we're also going to use the length to adjust the kernel window, which I'll show in another slide. 
So in the x-axis, we're going to go from no scaling to square root of 2 based on whether we are axis aligned or we're running on the diagonal. So when we're axis aligned, we don't do any scaling on the x-axis. But when we're on a diagonal, we're scaling by square root of 2 because we can allow a larger kernel there without seeing any banding. The banding would have been created by the negative lobe. The y-axis, it has no scaling to double size. And we use the no scaling for the small features. And that way, we end up with a small symmetric kernel that doesn't sample outside of the feature itself. And as the feature gets larger, we're using a longer, longer kernel so that we can better restore the edge. The EC kernel itself started as a polynomial approximation to Lankos 2. Lankos is expensive. It's a, you'd be using a sine, a reciprocal, a square root. Those are transcendentals. Those run at sometimes quarter rate, depending on your hardware. And therefore, they're best to be avoided if possible. So instead, this is broken down into a base and a window, similar to the way Lankos is a sync function that's windowed by another sync function. And also because we want the window to be adaptable to the length. So when the window is small, we have a kernel that goes from plus or minus square root of 2. That window has been shortened, so it actually truncates the negative lobe. We don't get as much sharpening. We don't have the, uh, the ringing and other problems that we would potentially have. The wide kernel goes from plus or minus 2, and that has a very strong negative lobe, which helps restore the edge. Once the ECU is finished with its filtering, we go on to the deringing step, where we take the local 2x2 two two texel quad, the min and max of RGB, and we use that to clamp the ECU output. This removes all the ringing. It also removes artifacts of the limited 12-tap window that we have. Therefore, when, when scaling gets larger, we start seeing the clipping of the window, so it's best to actually run the deringing step to try to minimize that. For engine integration, I will be speaking of some of the details and some of the interesting choices that we took for Unity. The first step is to introduce you guys to HDRP, which is what we did this integration of FSR into. HDRP stands for High Definition Rendering Pipeline, and this is essentially our AAA pipeline that we have at Unity. This, this pipeline has a full, full on post process setup, it has a physically based rendering and many advanced GPU algorithms. Uh, it utilizes ray tracing and a lot of all that, those advances features. For more information, feel free to check this slide uh, provided here uh, so we, you can explore a bit what HGRP does. Uh, in HGRP, the typical, run, in, as well as other engines, the typical path for a rendering pipeline is like this. Your first half on the left side, you have your rasterization passes. So that means all, everything that is graphics, everything that it's utilizing the rasterizer. This outputs a bunch of uh, surfaces or textures that contain information about your scene. For example, motion vectors, normals, depth, uh, color, as in color result from lighting. And uh, you can also have all those things like depth pyramid. All these surfaces are utilized as an input in your post-processing pipeline, which then outputs the final image that goes into your frame buffer. Now, it's important to realize that there's two key spots in this pipeline. Uh, what we talk about in dynamic resolution setting is that we usually assume that there is a high cost on rasterization, particularly around high resolution setups like 4K or 2160p. Uh, usually inside the post-processing pipeline, there is some effect or some pass that takes this low resolution buffer along with other metadata and converts it to the target resolution. For our dynamic resolution scaling setup, we have essentially two points in scheduling. We have uh, before post-processing and after post-processing. So in this example, before post-processing is everything that occurs before the post-process chain. So we apply the scaling right after we have our color, depth, motion vectors, and normals outputted from our rasterization passes. It is during here that we uh, do our operating and then we send that to a post-processing chain. The disadvantage of this path is that we're actually spending a lot of cost uh, 
in a post-process chain because it's at full resolution. For example, depth of field typically becomes a bottleneck in these cases when it's uh, high quality. Uh, an example of a before post-process upsample pass would be something like TAA uh, upsample, so temporal and TLA is upsampling, or checkerboard rendering. Uh, we have the other side of the coin, which is the after post-process scaling. What this does is that it actually runs a post-processing pipeline at a, low at a low resolution, and is right at the end, right before going to the final pass, that it performs the upscaling. And it is exactly in this spot where we decided to integrate our FSR Fidelity FX Super Resolution algorithm. It's important to understand that in Unity we have two ways of aliasing, that is ways of looking at a piece of memory so we can, uh, we can rasterize to it in different resolutions. The first one is software-based and this works for rendering platforms like uh, DX11, DX12, Vulkan, Metal, GNM, essentially all of the ones that SGRP supports. And then the second one is hardware-based. This is only a subset of re uh, rendering APIs that contain more advanced features like uh, direct access to resource descriptors and also uh, texture aliasing, resource aliasing. So for software-based, the technique is quite simple. Uh, all we do is that during sampling time, we apply a scale on the X and Y axis and we just scale the UVs of whatever texture we are uh, sampling from. We do take care of the borders, as you will see in the next slide. For rasterization, what we do in software base is that we set up a viewport that is a subset of the size of the uh, final target. And uh, in Unity, we have the setup on a render graph where we usually keep a render target that is the max resolution of all the cameras is within this uh, render target that we uh, create virtual or software views for these utilizing these scales. Uh, this is an example of the functions that you can use to border your UVs. So you have to be very careful when you're upscaling UVs because you do not want to tap a texel at the corner if you're doing bilinear sampling. Uh, you want to make sure that your UVs are uh, nicely clamped. That way you don't have that problem. For hardware-based uh, aliasing, what we do is we set up, uh, it's a bit different. What we have is a, a heap, a very big heap on the, on the C++ side of Unity, where we essentially allocate a place resource. In DirectX 12, they're called place resources. And uh, we start placing these resources on the heap on demand, depending on the resolution that we need at the moment. Uh, this is where the aliasing is occurring. Uh, the, the only tricky thing about this approach is much faster for software-based because we don't have to use multipliers or viewports. Uh, we're actually dealing at the hardware level with that native resolution. But the problem is that we are creating descriptors for every resolution that we encounter. So we have to be very careful on the CPU implementation to make sure that we can recycle these descriptors and we don't inflate memory and incur in a CPU performance cost. For the chain of our effect, what we do is we start with a, um, we start uh, our Uber post process. This is basically what outputs uh, everything after Bloom and after tone mapping. We do a square root of that target. So we output at the square root uh, space or what we call the spatial perceptual space. This goes into the ESU algorithm, which consumes it and then just applies the upsampler uh, after it outputs the upsampler, we make sure we go back to linear space and then we apply the RCAS algorithm. And the RCAS algorithm will just uh, improve on edging and all the uh, details that were potentially lost before. You can see here uh, two images where we differentiate between uh, native resolution. This would be a 360p crop of a 4K output. And then here is with FSR applied. You can see that we do recover most of that detail. There should be more detailed images in the PowerPoint slide attached to this presentation. The next step is to take care of the extra detail that we lose because of the derivatives that we're doing when we're rendering a lower rasterization resolution. So what we want to do in this case is push the mid bias of all of our material textures so that we can recover this detail. 
In this example, you can see that we do quite well by recovering most of the detail loss in this texture. The mean bias, uh, the mean bias formula that we we'll use is the ratio of the input resolution divided by the output resolution. Then what we do is we take a log uh, base two of that, we get a negative mean bias, assuming the input resolution is smaller. And all we do is that we push that to our sampler functions. Uh, we decided to use sample LOD bias, which is a function available in DX11 and in uh, Vulkan platforms. Then uh, we utilize that value and we're able to push that in the software. So it became quite easy for us. Uh, another, a big advantage is that in Unity, we have a pretty good distinction of what is a material texture and also what is a system texture. So it's quite easy to differentiate between them and only apply the, bi only apply the bias to those uh, resources that are dependent on that. Lastly, uh, particles and transparent low resolution. So in Unity, we have a uh, pass that is for transparency low resolution. What this does is it actually renders rasterizes transparency to half resolution with a DAO sampled uh, depth buffer. Uh, this, of course, if you are using DRS, dynamic resolution scaling, is going to look very small. Uh, you're going to lose a, a lot of quality because you're already half resolution. So if you start downscaling your half resolution buffer, it's not going to look nice. So one of our fixes for this pass uh, was to actually clamp the minimum resolution at, at which it could go and give this control to the artists so they can decide a well, you know, uh, which setting in their pipeline gets affected. Uh, it's important to know that, like, you know, transparent resolution, it frees us uh, quite a bit to do more expensive, uh, usually very low occupancy uh, shadings, like uh, in uh, transparencies that utilize refraction and things like that. So for performance, uh, we decided to use a standard 4K scenario we're utilizing our scene in Spaceship Demo on a PS4 Neo. Uh, resolution is 2160p. Uh, for uh, ESU, turns out that we're spending 0.43 milliseconds with an occupancy of four waves. And for RCAS, we have a performance of 0 0.16 milliseconds with an occupancy of 10 waves. And this is the not optimized 32FP path for these algorithms. And with this, we cover pretty much all the pieces that we had to touch on the uh, Unity high-definition high rendering pipeline. And as you can see, some of these pieces weren't very challenging. They were quite straightforward to land in the engine. And that's it.